I'm Loki Karuna, and this is Triloquy. Thanks for checking in, and greetings from New York. The weather is starting to get warm again here. I should say it's gotten warm again, so it's the beginning of a few months of sweating here in the city and in the studio, but <laughs> grateful as always for everything, especially for each and every one of you. Thank you for your support, your continued support, and for doing what you can to help us all decolonize so-called classical music. If you'd like to catch up on opuses of days past, to uh, if you'd like to learn more about the show and some of the people who make it possible, or if you'd like to donate to the show, you can do all of that on our website. It's T-R-I-L-L-O-Q-U-Y dot O-R-G. I'm honored to bring to you today a conversation between myself and violinist Elizabeth Chang. Elizabeth is professor of violin at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's a member of the violin and viola faculty at the pre-college division of the Juilliard School, and she's artistic director of Green Mountain Chamber music festival. Very busy and very impactful in the field. Well, earlier this month, Elizabeth released a new album with pianist Stephen Beck called Sonatas and Myths, works by Shimonovsky, Dohnanyi, and Bartok. So we're going to talk a little bit about that this week. I have to say it's not completely in my wheelhouse to highlight music that's rooted in the European canon and the European tradition, but you know, as my politics around classical music continue to evolve, I think it's vital that we make sure we're keeping humanity in the front of our discourses and dialogues instead of building barriers that keep progress from happening. I'll talk a little bit more about that after the interview, because there is a thin line between holding on to your values and, you know, being reasonable. But uh, for now, <laughs> let's uh, get into my chat with Elizabeth Chang. To get us there, of course, we'll enjoy a little snippet from this new album. So here's Elizabeth take on the violin sonata number one of Bela Bartok, a bit of the end of it here. See you on the other side. most exciting uh, development I've, I've noticed is that students just as a matter of course are interested in a much more diverse range of repertoire. So um, my students at, at University of Massachusetts, they always come to me with, with new ideas about, or just the, uh, the, the, the names that some are now becoming sort of standard and familiar. They're, they're just very naturally part of their, their notion of the canon. And my students, my younger students at Juilliard pre-college, um, you, I'm sure you know Weston Sprod, who's done of this. Course, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so there's been a great effort to encourage students to to just think think out of box a little bit or out of the box we were in, mm -hmm. and um, and they've been and the students are completely responsive to that. There's, so there's been a real, um, just a, a lot of uh, the repertoire has changed enormously in the last. Um, decade, but especially the last five years, I would say. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, when when I think about the work that I've been doing specifically with composers, I've really had to face the fact that gender diversity is something that we have to talk about as well. While I'm proud of the programs that I've built that center women composers, the applications that I see for some of our programs are showing me that there are between 20 and maybe 22 percent of uh, folks studying composition specifically are women. And I'm sure that has reverberations outside of composition specifically. I wonder how you have been um, engaging the conversation of gender diversity at all. I mean, are your students representative of uh, diverse genders? Are you seeing things lean one way or another in your work? I wonder what your perspective is. Yes, I think that um, there's there's a in my student body, especially in Massachusetts, there is quite a lot of diversity of every sort. I, but you know, this is a very uh, community that's sort of progressive in that way. Um, not to say that they're, you know, I'm as someone belonging to the previous generation. I, um, you know, there's still some some residual, you know, 
um, frames of mind that we have to deal with. But I, among the younger people, I feel like it's they're 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 doing great, and they will uh, they understand what how how to think much more equitably. And moving forward, I'm very encouraged about. Um, yeah, I, when I was coming up as a musician, I never sensed as a I don't know as an eighth grader that there were more boys in the class than girls back 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 in those days was I, I wonder what you remember ab around uh growing up and developing as a musician in in that regard mm -hmm. that's uh, funny you should ask that well i don't think i was so aware of it but i think that my mindset was just to forge ahead and not think about things like that and so it's only recently as a result of the kind of conversations that are happening now that i actually look back and wonder whether that mindset was a product of being in that you know, you know so not, rather than just a personality trait so um and you know things have just as a as a uh to offer a glimpse into what it was like when I was coming up. I went to Juilliard pre-college from 1974 to 1982. And at the time I was the only Asian student in my studio, which is just unthinkable now. So, uh, so um, yeah, so times have changed a lot. Uh, I didn't, I didn't feel as a violinist. This is, I don't, I don't think that this particular demographic has suffered much in the way of gender discrimination or disparity. But, um, you know, I certainly have seen that in other uh, other instruments and, and in, in, in composition for sure, conducting, we all know, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate that perspective. I always think about thinking about the future requiring looking at the present. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that, you know, things seem to be moving in a, a positive direction when it comes even to student bodies that you're uh, engaging these days. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned uh, being a, a student at Juilliard pre-college uh, a few, just a few years ago. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about growing up in New York. It's one thing to think about having proximity to things like Juilliard's pre-college division, but are there other aspects of being a New Yorker that you would say impacted your musical and professional trajectories? Well, first of all, I grew up in the suburbs, so and I grew up in an immigrant family, so it was a very sheltered existence. I don't think I really had a typical New York experience. It's my, um, I think most people come to New York and the world has opened up. It was more for me, it was more like when I left New York and started to grow up that my world opened up. Um, so I think my, my, you know, my perception of the profession and of the world was just pretty constrained by the kind of family environment I had, um, you know, what wonderful artistic environment. My parents were visual artists and very interested in contemporary art, but um, pretty, in many ways, very, very sheltered from the, what was going on in the larger social fabric. So. Yeah. I wonder what the space is between what you initially saw as your professional trajectory and what Happened. I don't think many of us, when we pick up a violin or, or a bassoon, in my case, for the first time, we think about teaching and working in admin and recording and playing with orchestras. I wonder if, if you had a, a very specific idea in mind or was it broad? No, it was not at all broad. It was very narrow. <laughs> and I think that was a product of just, just lack of exposure and also kind of the culture in which we were raised back then, the way... The way we were taught by a uh, very old school people and um, just the, and there was not a lot of um, conversation about what was out there, what the possibilities are, what kind of impact it, you could make besides just standing up and playing beautifully. Um, so, yeah, so I, I came to it pretty gradually. Uh, I think the teaching was maybe the first step and I started to organize concerts and then, um, more concerts. <laughs> I started to organize festivals at my, when I, when I was hired here at UMass, I started organizing this, uh, a five college new music festival and a, uh, well, actually prior to that, my very first organizational adventure was a, um, a concert series. Uh, actually it started off as a festival, but now it's a concert series. Uh, in Cape Cod called Lighthouse Chamber Players, very small thing. And, um, but then, you know, I thought when I got to UMass, I was like, we have all these great composers, these great conform performers, and they're all very visible elsewhere. <laughs> and so let's do something to, um, to concentrate the wealth a little bit. And uh, together with a couple of colleagues, we started the Five College New Music Festival. 
um, with composers from, we had, you know, we had wonderful composers in each of the five colleges. So that was sort of the nucleus, but they're also fantastic performers. And so that's happening again, 2024. We do it every two years with a little bit of a hiccup through COVID. And um, they're, they're, you know, that's, we involve up to 60 performers and composers from the area, um, from the colleges and also a few regional people um, in for four or five concerts. And that's, that's, um, well, that's one project. And then I was also organized the UMass Bach Festival and Symposium with, with some other colleagues. And then I'm um, very recently, two years ago in 2021, I was hired to, as the artistic director of Green Mountain Chamber Music Festival, which is um, a much bigger project. <laughs> so that is a summer, four week summer fest festival in, in outside of Burlington, Vermont. And we have over 200 students and around 40 faculty. Uh, this, this summer we're putting on nine artists, faculty concerts and really countless student events. And all of those, um, all of those arenas have given me a chance to sort of um, think about programming, think about how we can move, uh, move the arts forward, and and also sort of help to to help to uh, cultivate, you know, good citizens in uh, artist citizens in, for the next generation. So yeah, I'm, I, but yeah, I, and to answer your question, I did not see that coming. Um, it happened very organically. And the teaching happened uh, out of necessity. And then I decided that I really, what oh, I found that I really loved it and got, got a great deal of satisfaction. I mean, it's been a little bit tricky to try to juggle everything, and uh, but I, it, it's all satisfying. So I'm, I'm, I feel very lucky. Yeah. What are your thoughts on preparing for such a diverse career? I mean, there are certainly things that translate when it comes to being a performer and organizing concerts and, and that sort of thing, but where your learning curves steep, I, I wonder what that part of the trajectory looked like for you. Um, I do think about that a lot with my students and just trying to cultivate habits of, of uh, agency so that, you know, and also responsibility and, and uh, that can that can grow. I think that um, uh, the the one thing that I do um, watch out for is a, a sort of narrowness of focus, which I think is not particularly healthy. I mean, you need that sort of that that um, mindset, uh, the the ability to to work in a solitary environment to 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 get to the a high level of your you know your uh, as a as a as a player as a musician. But you also need to engage with the world and you need to sort of realize what your role is and just be a good communicator or do your best <laughs> and, and, and be responsible about it and understand how how um, how all these complex relationships in the world, um, you know, they have every bit as much of a relationship to a musician's life as, it do, as they do to anyone else. And uh, so just, yeah, sort of, I like to, encourage my students to have sort of a no nonsense practical attitude towards what they need to do. So, yeah. Sure. Sure. And I love what you said about engaging the world. I, I've, I've noticed that that can be sort of a challenge for some people because what does that mean materially? Does that mean take your instrument out on the street corner and play? Does it mean get a job far away from music? You know, it can mean so many different things for so many people. I think, you know, when it comes to your students and what you try to push forward, with them specifically on that topic of engaging the world. I wonder what you offer, or what suggestions that you put forward. Yeah, well, I, th I feel like it's all relevant. I mean, it's, you know, the the um, trigger for this conversation is my album, which is really not maybe the most obvious example of, of this of, of this this way of thinking, but, you know, I am in the midst of preparing for the summer season at Green Mountain, and, and there are so many things we try to do in that way. Um, so, you know, we have um, an event coming up that is a, a weekend of a young, young award-winning quartet, which is very on very high level. That was formed at Green Mountain, and their their the featured event is a um, a fundraiser for music for food, and that's sort of incorporated now into as a regular event in our festival, as are the community concerts that students do throughout the throughout the uh the Burlington community so that um you know this is a service to 
the the profession to the the art form so that people are stumbling on this thing and realizing that maybe it's not so intimidating that maybe they do enjoy it and and it's uh, it, it it empowers the students to realize that they can you know they can they can they can bring their music anywhere um we have a lot of uh uh internal things going on within the festival that um encourage uh you know th there's a lot of deliberation in the recruiting and in the and the admissions we we have a partnership with equity arc and you, you know about that yeah. and um we're one of many organizations but to be honest one of the first ones that went on board and um we have three three faculty members who are sphinx laureates and so it's it's not like we're talking about it all the time but we're paying attention and um so there's you know there's always a little bit of mentorship happening sometimes it's over it sometimes it's not you know uh, we have a, a cohort of fellows who are who are young professionals who are on a very sort of fast paced trajectory, and their um, their role is to serve as assistant teachers and, and to perform with the faculty and sort of be in between, but are really cultivating the sense of what it's like to be a mentor, but also cultivating their network on the other side. So you know, there are just many different little angles. Anytime there's an opportunity to do something that reaches out, I, I, I like to try to find a, a way to make it happen. Um, we, you know, there are a lot of uh, mini educational opportunities that are embedded in the festival, um, both people coming from the outside and are going to the outside, uh, this sort of dialogue. And I think that, you know, gradually the connection in this in in this particular project, I'm hoping is going to get thicker and, and more thickly woven over time. Um, and I think you know, it's sort of there are little things here and there, and they there's a feedback you know thing happening where it it, it grows and and gets richer. Uh, it's not one thing, you know. So, well, I have to congratulate you again on having the capacity to record an album, considering all of the things that are, are circling around you. Uh, be before we talk about the um, the the music of sonatas and myths, I wonder how separate or how unseparate recording is for you, or as far as uh, preparation for recording, are you practicing in a different way? Are you thinking about what you're bringing forward differently, or is it more similar to chamber music or orchestral playing and, and those sorts of more traditional uh, aspects of the field? I mean, it certainly, it certainly is chamber music. The, I had a, a wonderful partner, Stephen Beck, throughout this project. Um, we did many, many performances of these works in preparation for the recording, so that it it felt like um, so we could bring bring the you know the the uh, an idea of what it felt like to perform to the recording studio. Um, it's you know on a practical level, it was pretty hard to find practice time with with everything that's happening, but um, but. Uh, you know, the, I would say the process is um, just kind of you're a little more accountable. You know, you have to think a little bit harder about the. I mean, I very much enjoy the spontaneity of a live performance, and to try to uh, understand what it is you want to preserve about that, um, but also think about the most thoughtful version that you of that of that that you might want to bring forward in in the in the recording, and. Yeah, so there's a lot of similarities, but it's just a very intense process, as I'm sure you know. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So why myths? I think sonatas is self-explanatory, but why sonata and myths, says the title of this album? Well, that was lifted from the uh, title, the Shimnovsky, which is myths. <laughs> but it is. I think that there is a certain, I mean, it, as we, the all three composers were born within a few years of each other and all these pieces were, were written within a decade of each other. So there is, this is like 1912 to 1921. And, and um, I think there was a, you know, the, the, the thread that runs through this is that um, these composers were kind of looking for a new, a, a, a uh, their own language. I think that there's, it's very, distinct in particular even though they're from that the same time period the three vo the three voices are extremely different um i the 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 myths in shipnovsky refers back to the 
the his um, it, the images that were in his mind were from classical Greek mythology, um, which is kind of an extreme example of going um, trying to find an, an, another reference point, in, in extreme in terms of time. Um, the of course Bartok we all know was was looking for inspiration in 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 folk music uh, of Hungary and but just one one thing that I think of now especially is that that was a very intense time it's like really surrounding the the first world war and like the some of the the scale of of trauma to um to to the world at that point uh and you know it's very people trying to orient themselves around what what they're trying to do with music and as on their also their lives being very much affected by by world events and you know, who who knew that, you know, we're in a time period now where people are also, you really can't not think about what's going on in the world. So, yeah. Right, right. You know, I, I want to highlight something that you said, you know, there to, to use a word from the album, again, myth. There's, I feel like there's this myth that composers of a similar time period, all male, all from Europe, that their music is the same. Or when you listen to it, there's not really much difference or much nuance. I wonder how you approached making the differences between these three composers approach uh, apparent in the in the recording. How did how did you engage really touching into the different perspectives and cultures and backgrounds of each of these composers, considering the fact that there are some who may see them as more similar than not? Right. I mean, they were wildly different. So there, it wasn't you know, there was no effort really to try it. You, you, it was not. You know, I didn't have to find a way to differentiate because it was it's so so worked into the music. Um, yeah, I was thinking about the fact that they are, you know, they kind of look the you know when when the the um, when the the label proposed this cover, I was like, so the three white dudes, you know, <laughs> just but and they say, well, you pick them, and 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 there's really no getting around it, but. But it, for me, it was also kind of a personal exploration. And this is, you know, I am coming to this from, a, a, you know, my parents were born in China, but I have no connection to that culture. I don't speak the language. This is this is my, you know, I feel like I have a, a like a claim on this this Western heritage also. And and I think it's like to make that connection um, feels like a very legitimate kind of artistic exploration for me um i not to not to say that that i i mean i don't at all turn you know i'm very very much embrace what's happened with the the as the repertoire expansion now but but for me this is very relevant to my my own um you know i was actually just in 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 the in china for my sabbatical and and the and the south and south, southeast asia and i found out that a relative of mine, very close relative, my father's half sister, is a celebrated artist in um, Singapore who was re really active in exactly this time period as mm -hmm. a French, like essentially French painter. Painter because my my half aunts were all born were born in well those this woman was born in France and and her language is also like. French impressionist, uh, and she she was educated in the salons of of Paris and in you know and New York and and uh, is now celebrated in Singapore as a Chinese woman whose whose art form is is French painting you know and so I think the sort of the boundaries are a little hard to define you know so uh, and it's neither here nor there but to me it was sort of striking that that uh, i felt a, a a connection to this woman who was um had she also did not speak chinese weirdly even though her her she was much closer she had been born in, in france grew up partly in the united states and then ended up in asia but and, and is identified as chinese but um her artistic language is 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 really European. And um, so <laughs> that's fascinating. It sounds like you have a, a similar legacy ahead of you. Well, well into the future, maybe someone will be saying a, a similar story about you one day. Well, I mean, learning about this made me because it was exactly this time period of my 
my my my guys here on this recording i thought oh this is really i would like to i would like to delve into this a little bit more so you know so, so for me this is a really yeah this is this is um more personal um adventure than a you know yeah i have to admit that my uh being so i think most people especially in the world of orchestral music uh know who knew who bartok was know who bartok was but it's my experience uh, working and programming radio that gives me any insight on uh, Shimanovsky and Dofnanyi. I don't think I came across either of those composers in my musical training. I wonder what your sense is on the familiarity of these composers, maybe within the violin repertoire or even beyond. Do you expect that many people will be familiar with the works that are presented here? Um. You know, it's a little bit hard to have perspective on that because, you know, what <laughs> they seem really familiar to me. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I take your point. Um, I think, you know, so, for example, any any Polish musician, Szymanowski is a household name, right? And, and any, you know, my Hungarian friends, you know, Dachnani is, you know, you don't, Dachnani and... He was such an important figure at the time, um, and as an educator as well, and um, you know, and so that that I think that in some circles that will be a very familiar name. Um, it's I my last album, I think, was a much harder nut to crack. Yeah. I so 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 this to me seems really friendly. So um, yeah. I love that. I love that. And I noticed that in the liner notes, you talk a little bit about these artistic transitions from the you know, 19th into the 20th century, you know, away from the romantic into something more. I wonder um, if this has any implications on today based on the work that you've done uh, with, with these composers and with this music. Do you identify any through lines or similarities between the time of these composers and now, as we think about the future of our field, the future of classical music? Um, I mean, maybe in the most general way. I mean, I think that, you know, I really, uh, part of my interest in the new music of today is that I think we need to really support, um, to support the spirit of exploration and, 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 rebellion and and evolution slash rejection of the of the old mm -hmm. uh, part of in my festival part of uh, one of the recent things that we have added is a a call for scores from young people so we just finished evaluating the there was maybe almost 100 submissions of string quartets and two winners were picked and uh and i think it's really important to um in our in our new music festival, Five College New Music Festival here, we program a really wide array of works and we also have another competition and we also ask for older composers to to write something for a new piece for uh, a, a violin duos just because I happen to have uh, be able to ask my students to, to learn them. But um, but I think, you know, there's there's in the wide range of things that we program some things resonate with some people better and some things are more successful in the long term than others and i think you know but we will never really um we, we have to give breathing room to the the people who are working and writing now uh, whether or not we like it you know whether or not it appeals to us at a particular moment or appeals to everyone else at a particular moment and i think so the spirit of of finding your voice is you know that's that has to be encouraged at all times. So, you know. Yeah. And yeah. When, I, when I think about an artist finding their own voice, I can't help but to think about a shared voice when we think about collaboration and, and what we create uh, together. You did mention uh, Stephen Beck earlier. I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit more about the collaborative aspect of the creation of this album. I mean, are, is the, uh, are you the... I, I, I would guess that you aren't the boss of the uh, interpretation. I'm sure there was lots of collaboration, maybe some conversation. Can you give me some uh, insight on what that looked like in the in the process of recording this? Um, well, you know, S Steve has a gigantic brain, so <laughs> you know, there's um, 
he has so much to, uh, he just notices so much. So there's like that there's, I spend a lot of time listening to, <laughs> listening to him, yeah. you know, period. Um, so I think the rehearsal process is pretty familiar to most musicians in, in that it's really different with different collaborators. You know, there's some people who are, who love to talk mm -hmm. uh, and others who really communicate more by suggesting things in their playing and that evolves in a certain way. Um, you know, I would say we're somewhere in between. Um, so the, you know, the, but very, I mean, he's so seasoned as a, player as a recording artist that uh, I profited enormously from that. So, sure. yeah. yeah. And what about the collaborations beyond you and Steve? I mean, what did, what do uh, conversations look like with sound engineers or people who, you know, place mics in a specific area? What, what was, what was that uh, part of the process like for you? Well, there's a lot of trust involved. I think it's just, you want to, I mean, you know, I know I, I'm not, um, I have an opinion about what the way a violin should sound, but I have no idea how that should be reflected in my placement. I, I, um, I know, I mean, I think that all of us who are performing musicians just develop a certain amount of humility because you just know that there are things that people hear better when they're not you, when they're away from you. And so if you trust the recording engineer, which I did enormously, Ryan Strayberry is wonderful. So, um, so you, if they think something needs to be done again, or something's fine, 100% relied on his word. So, yeah. And yeah. hey, yeah. you did mention that there were uh, performances of this music before the actual recording. It seems like playing to um, a concert hall is different than playing to a microphone. I wonder how you think about recreating a recording uh, or, or recreating a sound rather while thinking about space or, you know, with the magic of recording technology, are you able to play in a studio in the way that you would play in a large concert hall? Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely think that we were relying on the engineer to, 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 to work that out. Um, I mean, the, the many performances, the function of that, I think was to have a stronger image of, of the, of the experience as a performance than as of a recording and to carry that into the, into the, into the recording studio. So just to remember what, it, what, what it feels like, how you want this to feel as a performance. So, yeah. Does the uh, order of these uh, compositions on the album reflect how you have or would order them on a concert program? Is there is there something to how these appear on the uh, actu on the actual recording? Well, actually, in in the um, in the performances, we generally started with Dachnani and Pachinowski second, Bartoko is last. Um, you know the the producer uh, Becky Starbin thought that it, that Shimonovsky would make a good opener, and and I think it actually does. I think there's something very evocative about um, about you know. I think that in a, in a in a live performance, you certainly have a captive audience. <laughs> so in a way, if you you know you're we're going to get to the next piece, and they're probably not going to leave. And uh, I don't necessarily know, know that that's the case once you pick an album. So yeah. Can I ask you if you have a favorite among the three pieces? I have a, I have a pretty soft spot for the Bartok. Yeah, it's yep, very, yep. very, very durable music. <laughs> yeah. Well, how can people uh, listen to and and buy this album when it come when it comes out? Yeah, the release date. Um, I think I'd have to look up exactly when that is, but anyhow, um, it's yeah. I'm sure it'll be available on all the all the normal channels, and I, there'll be an announcement that comes out, and it's certainly available on Amazon. And you know, so yeah. Wonderful. And are there already plans for additional recordings or uh, additional projects? I have some thoughts. Um, not quite ready to share them, but, but I do. Yes, I have some ideas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wanted to uh, in in closing, I wanted to. Uh, loop back to our uh, previous conversation about you know how dynamic so many uh, musicians' careers are. You know the the different things that you spend so much time doing. You know we talk about how a performance uh, career, how practice 
can inform other aspects of the field. I wonder if it works the other way around. Is the work that you're doing administratively impacting your any of your musical approaches? Um, let's see. I, I mean, I, I immediately think of teaching when you ask this question, because teaching really affects my approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's, it really offers me an opportunity to, to um, fine tune my, my musical thoughts and also just um, verbalize them in, in a helpful way that is also helpful to me. So, so um, I, I definitely take away a lot from the teaching experience and carry that into the practice room and to the performance uh, arena. Um, administratively, uh, less direct, I would say. It's more just kind of a, a life outlook sort of thing that I, that of course influences me a lot, but I wouldn't it, like, I wouldn't say it, it it's, I try it, not to think too much about my administrative work when I'm practicing. It's, it tends <laughs> to be distracting. <laughs> so, yeah. From Myths of Composer Karol Szymanowski, that was Narcisse. That's the title of that, mu uh, that movement there. Beautiful playing by Elizabeth Chang alongside pianist Stephen Beck. And huge thanks to Elizabeth for joining me here on the Triloquy Podcast. I really appreciate getting to have the dialogue. If you're interested in checking out that album, visit Elizabeth's website. You can find all of the information there, and I will have it linked in the description of this opus. All right, so as I mentioned before the interview, I've moved pretty far away from affirming the canon, as it were, music from the traditional side of classical music, but I'm working to put my humanity at the front as much as I can. You know, a few years ago, I probably would have really pressed Elizabeth on why we need yet another album of music by dead white men from Europe. But at the end of the day, where would that really get us? What progress is made by pointing to the person instead of pointing to the issue that really drives the person. I'm working behind the scenes. I'll share uh, working behind the scenes on an initiative that I don't think I can quite speak to yet. Things are still in development, but it's really requiring me to tap into my Buddha nature and not get frustrated with views and opinions that differ from mine, because there are a lot of them. And sometimes they come from places where you wouldn't expect them. Um, it's one thing, you know, to talk about a decolonized lens through society overall, lots of frustration and disappointment to be found there because there's more than seems uh, to be able to be changed. But I think it's another thing to be in community with people who you think you're on the same page with, but it turns out you're not quite there. And again, I wish I could give more specifics on you know, this this latest little hurdle that I'm dealing with. But long story short, there are people within organizations, within classical music that really are ready to talk about anti-racism and even ready to talk about anti-capitalism within our field. Um, and then there are musicians like myself who have always been talking about the issue, people who are beginning to, you know, have that light bulb turned on. But at the end of the day, you got to be in certain rooms with certain people if you want to see the impact of those things systemically. Again, I've talked about it for years now at this point here on the Triloquy podcast, and I'm finally getting the opportunity to be in some of these really important spaces where these decisions are made. Um, and they're diverse spaces, I, I have to say. And uh, the the thinking, the mindsets, the politics are you know, more diverse than uh, I, I would like if, if I had to choose. Like, I guess what I'm learning as I sit and work in some of those rooms is that 
many of our attachments to either the genre of classical music as it's always existed, or even the comforts that we've been able to find and build thanks to classical music, whether it's a paycheck or certain positionality. That's really what's driving politics and the thing that we have to engage honestly and compassionately if we want to see some of these shifts. Now, I can hear some of you saying now, yes, of course, those things impact people's perspectives and politics around certain issues, which, you know, is something that I've been able to identify before this moment as well. That's that's a given. But my point is, it's interesting to see a doorway to the road to liberation, to to real freedom, to actual anti-racism, to, you know, doing what we can to dismantle capitalism and the patriarchy and for people to choose not to go in that direction. So often these conversations are hypothetical because, you know, there isn't the funding or the leadership or the infrastructure to push certain anti-racist and anti-capitalist agendas forward within classical institutions, even certainly outside of it. When we talk about reparations, for example, it's, it boils down to a hypothetical because no one can quite see how it will work and not being able to see how it will work determines the way people think about the issue at hand. You know, that that happens a lot. But my thing is when you actually have some of the things that you need in place, the leaders of organizations that are ready to go forward, even some of the funding that you need to push these things forward for progress to still be stalled in that sort of uh, equation is quite frustrating, if I must say. But Back to my original point is the humanity behind it all that I'm working on centering, because if I come to the work frustrated, that means whatever is built, what whatever proverbial cake is baked is going to have frustration all in it. And that's not helpful either. I'm thinking about people's needs and, and how I can shift thinking by helping folks understand that those needs can still be met. You know, asking myself questions like, what are people actually searching for and why are they searching for it? What are the factors that feed into a person's aspirations and goals? You know, what drives me is a deeply seated aversion to conditioning the next generation into thinking that so-called classical music isn't inherently racist. That That is where my politic comes from. My goal is to transform our ecosystem so that that word classical is contextualized within our musical traditions and sensibilities and not Europe's. There are so many artists out there that I would love to feature, especially in some of my radio stuff. Shout out to uh, WDAV, who are, have so much of an aversion and rightfully so to that word classical that they don't even want to be involved. Think about an album like um, Andre 3000's latest, uh, New Blue. Blue Sun, I think it's called. Think about that being considered classical music. And then think about Andre. And this isn't a conversation I've had, but I'm just giving him as an example as to not put anybody else out there. But think of him choosing not to be involved in any sort of classical infrastructure because he doesn't want the music that he creates associated with that phrase. See, that's what I'm really trying to flip around. I believe that music created here in the United States that's rooted from that spiritual, that's rooted from uniquely American traditions should be classical. And and it and it is classical. But the battle that we continue to fight is, you know, to what degree do we want to hold on to the Eurocentric definition of that word? And I think there are needs connected to that that we have to acknowledge. And again, bring me back to humanity. You know, what drives other people from my perspective is a love and nostalgia for this classical music that I'm ready to admit that I never had. Now, that's not to say I didn't have good times as an orchestral musician, but it's the path that was set before me as a child. And it's the path that was set before so many other children that became adults. We're justifying the thing because we're doing it and not because it's justifiable. Now, I'm pairing my human experience and my politic with other people's human experience with this genre and working on how I can help people see my perspective again. That's why I would have Elizabeth Chang on this podcast at this point, because really having those dialogues and building that relationship at this point that I see is the only way forward, unless we're just going to, you know, take our blowtorches and burn down every symphony hall, which if that's something you're interested in, text me. I don't know. But <laughs> but in the meantime, that rapport building and that relationship building, that trust is uh, how I think the conversation can move forward at this point. Because again, we even have spaces 
where the ingredients are there, the leaders, the funders, and all that, and there's still this aversion, there's still this nervousness. So it's uh, it's, it's what we got to deal with. Now, people can't see my perspective or even your perspective, for that matter, if you're not willing to meet them where they are. Classical music is racist. That's where I am. There are lots of people who can help us radicals dismantle its racism who are still completely bought in if we can build the rapport and trust to have the dialogues we need to have to move it all forward. That's also where I am. Two things can be true. Now, I hope you'll think about humanity and how you can put that to the front as you dialogue and engage people from different walks of life and people with different politics. You know, who is the human being? wearing the MAGA hat? Who is the human who blindly supports the genocide in the Middle East? You know, who is the human who believes that there's nothing wrong with centering Western European culture and history in our application of the phrase classical music? And more importantly, how can we connect with those humans in a way that will help them see what we see, to help them see what I see? That's what I got for you this week and hope you'll uh, apply that in your own life in a whatever way you can. I'm sure that for some of you, you're in your own bubble. Everyone agrees with you. There's no conflict. But for the rest of us, there's some dialogue to have. There's some human connection to be made. And there's some values-driven conversations that we can have to, if not meet in the middle, shift toward something more equitable, something more liberated. I I'm not quite ready to give up, and I hope that you aren't either. Thanks again for your continued support and advocacy. I'll talk to you all again soon. Peace.